and it feels good to be a bad guy Telling stories that bring the underworld to life Gangsters, mobsters, hustlers, monsters Stars of the conversation as we sip on our libations So come and share some laughs, it's true crime with a twist Every episode's a banger, you don't want to miss Infamous. Welcome to Say Hello to the Bad Guy I'm your host Locke And this is the podcast where we drink, smoke, and bullshit about the life of historic criminals Now we're talking outlaws and gangsters We're not going to cover too many serial killers that's just a little dark for me, and this ain't no true crime podcast. But really, you can't call this a history podcast, because I'm no historian. Just a history fan that does some research and bullshits about it with his friends. So speaking of my friends, let me introduce you to my guest host. So first with us today, we got Lorraine McLean. Hello. And then also with us today, we got Dan the Man. I also say Hello. And then for the first time on in a while, uh, we got Tone back. What up, though? It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming on. We'll kick off the drink roundtable real quick. Lorraine, you want to start us off? Oh, man. <laughs> what, well, you want to go last? We'll come back know, to you. I'm just embarrassed because I'm drinking the same thing as the last time because it's so good. It's the odd side bean flicker shamrock it's so good it's worth drinking twice on the show mm-hmm. i'll say that it's it's good i'm a big fan and this one it's not going to come out to the 21st so there'll be a couple episodes in between so it'll oh, be like okay. a, a new intro we'll title nice. this episode the second flick <laughs> <laughs> sounds dirty oh what about you duke what you got to drink? Well, I, unlike last time, am not drinking tea again because that was some bullshit. So I'm back <laughs> drinking again. And uh, so Three Floyd's Gumball Head. What? American Wheat Pale Ale. So I ain't doing green tea, but I do got my green leaf, baby. <laughs> All right. What about you, Tone? What do you got oh, to man. drink? I just kept kept the basic and uh got me some Corona. Oh, you basic bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Stick to the classics. Uh, nice hey, and refreshing. One very fine cerveza. <laughs> yeah, I mean you can't go wrong with Corona. Like but, I always say, if it's good enough for Snoop Dogg, it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, and all of me familia in Fast and Furious, Dom Toretto. That's that's a straight. Corona household too, so for sure. All right, uh, I got a French connection, which I know we've had on the show before, but it's a uh, it's a real simple cocktail because it's just two liquors, amaretto and cognac. Mm. So I use Cavassier and De Serona, but you can easily do it cheap, cheaper with like Hennessy and amaretto. It's uh quick and easy, and it's something with the different flavor balances where. Even for being just two different liquors, it gets a lot of different flavors out of it. So it's a quick and simple cocktail, and it's one of my go-tos because I do that and the Fat Elvis because both of them are the same trick. Two liquors with maybe a little garnish or something. And what, pretend like pretend like I'm cocktail mixing. What's in the Fat Elvis? That's what I call it when I'm having problems on the toilet. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, I got a Fat Elvis happening. <laughs> the Fat Elvis is the Howler Head Banana Whiskey. And then, like, screwball peanut butter whiskey. Okay. And then you could either do it as a shot. I do it on ice, and I'll put it with, like, a little cherry Coke. Mm. It's pretty good. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> so we did this in January, and it seemed to be a big hit. A lot of people reached out. We got a lot of good feedback. So today, instead of covering a bad guy, we are going to be covering... The month of February in mob history. This ain't negotiation time. This is Scarface, final scene, fucking bazookas under each arm. Say hello to my little friend. You gotta get a cooler intro with that. This month in mob history <laughs> in the month of February. <laughs> awesome. That's it. That's my trick is I've done it twice in a row and it works every time. I just have to do it very poorly. And you'll get so pissed off that you go ahead and do it. <laughs> Hello, you are listening to the Duke. I take intros very seriously. 
No, J Bone was actually uh confused by it. He listened to the January drop. He was like, What is this like the style of the show now? Is this what it's gonna be? I was like, No, it's just an extra little happy month format. Word? It, it was happy. I'm yeah. having a good time. Well, we got a lot of good feedback on it, and uh I would say one thing that was very common was that nobody agreed with you in thinking that uh the Sopranos finale was one of the best finales. <laughs> that was an on hot take. People were not a fan of. Oh, I've said it a thousand times that a lot of people hate it, and I don't know why. That's like one of the most hated finale, so I know why people get mad when I say I liked it. Well, you also said... You did call it call my shit. I did not like it at first. I will admit mm-hmm. that. But afterwards, no. I that's what made me rewatch. I was like, no, cannot be this bad. So I rewatched it and then had it a little more clear. I was like, oh, that's what I said. Is you didn't not understand it watching it one time through. There's no. And way. I think I think that's might be a lot of people's problem. They just watch it that first time and they're like, no, fuck this, and they never like rewatch. But I think. You rewatch it. It's I love it. But Great. back to the month of February. <laughs> I just told you that I had to deal with a bunch of fucking people telling me that they disagree with your take on it, and then you're like, you know what? Let me say it one more time <laughs> so you can hear their bullshit again. This month in mob history, Duke doubles down. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. All right, I know. That we just started doing this, but I think it's possible that February could be the greatest month in mob history. Okay. Oh, come so, on. We started out with Luciano, Capone, like all the big players. Who else was it? It was uh There's a lot. There's Rothstein's yeah. birthday, the Costello's death. It, it, there was a lot. And this one, oh. I will say January still probably beats February, but for a minute when I first started putting the research together, I was like, man. February might have them. I figured last time we started with birthdays, we'll kick it off the same way. The biggest birthday in February is Benjamin mm-hmm. Bugsy Siegel, who was born February 28th in 1906. Wait, so he's younger than Al Capone? Yes. Al Capone was born in 1899, so he's about seven years younger. And he was known as being a younger hot shot. He was definitely a pretty wild guy. That's why they called him Bugsy back in the day. It was like a name for crazy. Oh, that's one that didn't age but like Bugsy and being Bugs. That's why Bugs Bunny is Bugs because he's a wacky fella. And like yeah. nowadays people hear Bugsy. I think most people just think of Bugsy Siegel. Yeah. That's um, how big he was. He He took the name Bugsy and was like, nah, it's cool now. It's just me now, even though it used to be a common thing. Now it's just me. But he, actually, he hated it. So nobody called him Bugsy to his face. And he was real violent. One of the ways he got moved, he was in New York. He got moved out west. And one of the things he had a problem with when he was uh, when he would work with Murder, Inc. and stuff, he wouldn't take a managerial approach. He was like, well, no, I could still just go kill people. And eventually they're <laughs> like, okay, Bugsy, go out west or something. And uh <laughs> But any of his friends to his face, they all called him Benny. Hmm. That's when you're so crazy, they can't call you crazy. But behind your back, your nickname is crazy. <laughs> um, well, that's what we call you. Say to my face. Say to my face. Well, no, I will this... say that uh, he not only uh, took the name Bugsy and made it his own. I mean, involuntarily, I guess. But also, whenever you think of, or at least me, whenever I think of Bugsy Siegel, I always think of that uh, jacket that you got on this picture, the old checkered jacket. It seems like he's always wearing that motherfucker. Yeah, he was definitely a dapper guy. Well, because early in his career, he went out to California. So he was like a stylish gangster. and oh, uh Hollywood guy. When he went to Hollywood, all the Hollywood people loved him because they're like, oh, there's this gangster. And he was... You know, like he walked in the room, all the dudes wanted to be him and all the girls wanted to be with him. And then some of the stuff started coming out and he started getting like arrested for murders and stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, everybody's <laughs> like, oh no, he's like a real gangster. Like he kills people. And it's not as cute as we thought it was. <laughs> Wait, did you cover him on the a podcast yet? Uh, we did not. He's a real big name guy, but I think eventually 
we'll get into him, but he's he's one of the founders. He came up with Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. So he's one of those. Yeah, he's one that's popped up a lot, especially almost every episode that we have about Vegas. He normally pops up at least once or twice. Yeah, he started the Flamingo. Flamingo Hotel Mm -hmm. was Bugsy Siegel's baby. So when we got Bugsy Siegel, I went with him. I figured he'd be the biggest name that would be have a birthday. But I got the biggest in reference to the podcast that has a birthday in February would be... It better be bigger than fucking Bugsy Siegel because Lorraine was not impressed. I know. But I do like... We know this lady. Ada. So February 15th, 1864 was the birthday of Ada Everly. So. Yeah, that was the year I was born. I was born <laughs> earlier than my little horse sister, Eva. <laughs> How do you remember that voice you did? Because <laughs> everywhere I went, my little sister just wanted to copy me. Or no, it was the other way around. This was one of the rare cases where uh, Ada, the older one, just sort of followed the younger one around. Yeah, it was uh, Ada and Minna. Oh, Minna. I don't know why. You I said Eva. I keep. It would be great if it was Ada and Eva. But, but it's it's an episode we covered, Ada and Everly, and they actually kind of pertain to Capone because they were in, uh, now I'm blanking on the name of it, but the Chicago, levy? yeah, the Levy, which was like the red light district of Chicago, which is where organized crime was basically birthed out of, you know, it, it gave path to Big Jim, which gave path to the Chicago outfit as we know it. And uh, all they were was a couple a couple sisters that had it rough and figured they could start a brothel where everybody was treated a little bit better. And uh, I believe we referred to them as pussy pioneers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because they did. They invented the, the They didn't necessarily invent it, but the shoey was invented at their place. Uh, themed stripper rooms and stuff. Poontang, the mm-hmm. little yeah. Asian lady who actually that's why Poontang is now slang because of her. Getting laid. Yeah, they had the mermaid room. Remember? Yeah. Remember? <laughs> now, I will say it's one of the, definitely one of the more not safe for work episodes. So if you're a sensitive listener, you might want to skip that one. But uh, I don't know. It's one of my favorite episodes. It's one of my like favorite it. episodes. Mine too, you guys. Oh my God. There's titties all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah see, Tom likes it too. Bam. Four <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> Oh, look at all these fellas. Uh, so rounding out the February birthdays. Oh, is that my dad in the bottom left? <laughs> <laughs> yep. We'll get to him. We'll go like around the, uh, we'll go clockwise from up here. So uh, February 3rd, 1904, it's Pretty Boy Floyd, who's Depression era bank robber. <laughs> He's um pretty. <laughs> this guy right here in the middle, that's Sonny Francese, Francese. So it's Michael Francese's uh, dad. Okay. He lived to be 103 years old. Oh, damn. I don't uh, want a lot, that. A lot of people think of him. He's like one of the last of like legit old school gangsters. But he went to prison at like 93 and did seven years when his youngest son snitched on him. What? <laughs> Yeah. What? Yeah. Who snitches on their ninety-three-year-old dad? <laughs> That's yeah. What the heck? It was, was clout chasing. <laughs> he pissed him off. Um, off. I want to know his secret. How the fuck he made it to ninety-three? That's you want to live that long? Well, no, not no, probably not. Fuck that. <laughs> just, what live to ninety-three just so my fucking asshole son can snitch on me? No, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he was born February 6, 1907, uh, 1917. This guy is Lepke, the, this happy cat is, uh, <laughs> Lepke Buckholter. Holy shit, I didn't what? know Trooper was a mobster. <laughs> uh, Lepke Buckholter, even though he looks super happy in this picture, he was, uh, one of the leaders of the Jewish branch of the Murder Inc. He got uh, electrocuted in Old Sparky and Sing Sing, got the death penalty. That funny guy? Yeah. (laughs) That happy-go-lucky fella? (laughs) He's not as funny as he looks. Wow. Uh, Tell to his face. (laughs) He's watching a body get dismembered. That's what you don't see. Ew, that's Uh, terrible. 
So this happy old guy down here that <laughs> looks like Duke's dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's Big Jim Colosimo. Oh, I heard of him. Yeah. Big Jim. It was... looks like he had like it was a professional photographer and they were just taking random shots with like, you know what, sit on that ledge up there. It's like <laughs> Mm, I don't want like ah, just sit for a second. He's like, all right, for a second, I'll sit. Uh, nope, go off of it. <laughs> so that's actually exactly what that is. So Big Jim <laughs> called it. This is towards the end of his career, and uh, he was like a real tool. And he had got married to this older lady because she ran a bunch of brothels, and they like married to combine their forces and make this big super gang and. uh why, hello, big fella. How are you doing? <laughs> so he had this giant gang and then made all this money and then eventually he got sick of her and he left her for, like, some 20-year-old showgirl. Nice. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's not nice. Uh, but he has, her name was Dale Winter. and Her he's name got was a, Dale? Yeah, her name was Dale. Okay, Lorraine, you're just oh. wanting to hate on this wonderful <laughs> young lady that came into Big Jim's life. If that's going to be your attitude, why don't you just sit this one out? Hey, fellas, he made a good move, huh? Way to go, Big Jim. <laughs> All right, Lorraine, you can come back. Um, <laughs> But they went out and did like a whole session of glamour photos. And you can see pictures oh. of Big Jim just caking with his new girlfriend, just happy as a motherfucker, looking like a big dork. Is that oh, a no, JC like the early... photo shoot? The early yeah. 1900s version of uh, you have to post pictures of your girl on Instagram to make it real. Like, why are there no pictures of us together on your Facebook? <laughs> we had to do this, so we had to. That's what got him killed, too, because Johnny Torrio and Al Capone was like, let's start bootlegging and make a shitload of money. He's like, I got my little restaurant and my new <laughs> girlfriend, and I'm cool. And they're like, all right, well, see you, Jim. <laughs> I can't do... I can't do gangster shit and awkwardly pose on tiny fountain walls at the same time, okay? But no, Jim, you just don't retire. <laughs> the last one here, this is Carmine Galante. Uh, he was known as The Cigar, so he was a longtime mob boss in New York also. He was born on February 21st, 1910. And then the honorary birthday mentions in February are Jimmy Hoffa, Vito Rizzuto, who was uh, the Montreal mob boss. They call him the Montre the Canadian Teflon Don. And this guy over here is John A. Gotti. They call him <laughs> Junior Gotti or John Junior. But he's not actually a junior. But that he, he was uh, he ended up being a boss of the Gambino family, too. Hmm. I wonder where Jimmy Hoffa is now. Renaissance Center. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've heard that guy that says that, that he says he's seen him getting buried inside the Renaissance Center. What Everybody got a good is. Hoffa story. Yeah, there's like a thousand. Every fucking five years they dig up somebody's yard because they get some tip. I remember it was just a couple years ago somebody like got their driveway all dug up or something because somebody in prison said that's where they put him was in the cement. So they fucking jacked everything up and he wasn't there. So if we say it here, they're going to dig up the Renaissance? They, they won't. No. I don't think they're going to take you legitimate, but... It wasn't me. It was Tone. He's believable. That is true. <laughs> I believe him. And all the people. <laughs> <laughs> Every time Tone says titties, I'm like, that's sincere. Uh-huh. Get us. <laughs> <laughs> See? I believed it. We got a couple big items, and I didn't know what section to put under, so we always have births and deaths, and we always got some pop culture st stuff. So I guess we'll call this legal, because last time we had the kafal for hearings and uh, uh, the start of prohibition. So the biggest thing, from a legal perspective, that I would say happened in February in mob history is on February 1st, 1893, and it was this dude right here. Say that, uh, say that last name, Lorraine. <laughs> Go for it. I just said say that name. Emmanuel Notaparatolo. <laughs> that was perfect. And he nailed it. So you just mumble through it, and then it always works out good. <laughs> We're just going to start utilizing this more on the podcast. I'm just going to show you the words, and then you can say them. It <laughs> save me a lot of a lot of stuttering and editing and shit. <laughs> this month on the legal perspective. We have Emmanuel Nonobolatolo. 
<laughs> Not to be confused with the Monopoly guy. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of visual jokes today, people. Well, so all these pictures that we see, you can go to the Instagram and you'll be able to see the picture or the Facebook too. So, you sound so old. You can go <laughs> to the Instagram. <laughs> if the you Facebook. log into the the interwebs on your cellular device, the World Wide will, Web, you could find links to these photographs. They could be on the uh, the instant chat in the uh, face space. Thank you. You could just use the Google. Yes, <laughs> I think there's an application for that. Yes, maybe you can ask Jeeves. <laughs> if you go to links.badguypodcast.com. It'll have all of them. You just got to click whatever one is your thing, and it'll take you straight to it. If not, get a hold of him on AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be on a GeoCity site. So, Emmanuel Notabartolo. I should have left it where you said it. <laughs> Mr. Emmanuel. He is a Sicilian aristocrat, so he's born to a, a wealthy family, but he served in the military. He got into politics. Uh, he was real smart with financials and he was on an anti-corruption cr- campaign. And this was at a time when the um, actual mafia was growing in Sicily. So he was on a campaign to end the corruption. So he got made the director of the Bank of Sicily, where he was able to eliminate most of their corrupt loans that were costing the bank and the people a ton of money and it was just uh, benefiting basically like these mobsters and criminals and stuff and he straightened that all out and he got voted uh he got made the mayor of palermo and he was kind of doing the rudy, rudy giuliani thing mm. straighten the sicily, sicily out there there was a whole lot of stuff and all i got out of it was i'm gonna start using the phrase he was good at financials <laughs> <laughs> put that on a resume <laughs> hey you can't deny he started to bake he, he was good with financials he had it down look I'm no money story <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on February 1st 1893 uh, Manuel was on a train he was in like his first class camper or whatever and uh Two men came in and they stabbed him 27 times and then threw him off the train. Wait, that's the day he was born? That was the day he died. So he was actually born. (laughs) He was thrown off a train the day he was born. He was born. The mayor of the town started a bank and all this, like two hours as a baby. Right. Okay. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) They threw him off a train the day he was born? Oh my God. (laughs) I had the whole, the whole it was one I of thought... those ter- it was one of those Terminator things. The mafia came back in time <laughs> and they sent a Terminator to kill him as a baby no. and throw him off the train. And <laughs> so listen, I might be high, but I was thinking that this infant was getting stabbed and thrown off the train. <laughs> My bad. Uh, I, I just want to hear hear Arnold Schwarzenegger say that line. I'm looking for John Notabolo. <laughs> Have you seen him? <laughs> Have you seen him? <laughs> So this is known or is commonly thought of the first of the major hits against uh, political targets by a criminal organization to bend government to their will. So it's kind of the first big precedent. It's the first big hit they were ever known of. And the two people that stabbed them both got arrested, ended up getting off uh, due to technicalities. Off the train. (laughs) Yep, they, they got off the train, <laughs> off the charges, and everything. Dang! Like, you know what? You guys don't do shit like that. Get off of this train. <laughs> shame on you, sir. Poor shame. And in the first Take class that baby car, with you. <laughs> take your dead baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you might as well take the stroller. What the hell am I going to do with it now? <laughs> For the record, no baby was killed that I know to, know of in this story. <laughs> It's a much more positive story when just a brave man was murdered, not a baby. Oh, but that ain't what the kids want nowadays. Lock, they want action, they want thrills, they want dead infants being tossed off in trains. You don't get it. You're the old schools. You don't understand the Instagrams and whatnots of the day. Instagram. That is true. 
That's the second time I've been accused today of not knowing how to work with the Instagrams. <laughs> well, this is the second time today I've been accused of throwing dead babies into stories that they have no place being in. Oh, my God. But the biggest event that happened in February is on... Ooh, Lorraine in the back of the class? <laughs> yes, Lorraine? I think we all know what's about to happen. Did it happen on February 14th? It did. <laughs> was there red hearts involved? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of red. Definitely. It was pretty ugly. So. And one live dog? And there was one live dog. A surviving dog. Mm -hmm. So September 14th, 1929 was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which, okay. as we know, is... Uh, the biggest mass murder. Well, nowadays it wouldn't even be close. But <laughs> seven people were murdered of Bugs Moran's Northside gang on orders from Al Capone. And his name was Bugs, so he must have been crazy. We I was thinking that er earlier when we were talking about the Bugs Eye. I knew that we had another one coming up, Bugs Moran. Well, I mean... In the mob world, there's a bunch of Bugsies. Like we said, at this time, it was pretty common. There's Bugsy Goldstein, and there's, you know, a whole bunch of them. But, yeah, Bugs Moran was the inherent boss. And we know Al Capone set up the hit. I would think Jack McGurn probably planned it. And Killer Burke. Uh, there was two Tommy guns and a shotgun. They lined them up, dressed as cops, mowed them down, seven dudes. And uh, they finished one of them with a shotgun to the head, which is pretty gross. Yeah. Such a tragedy. Someone in the back said, finish him! And that was the fatality the shotgun. When I seen that wall uh, back in uh, September last year. Went to Vegas at the Mob Museum. Yeah. yeah. Shit, yeah. everybody on this episode has been to the old Mob yeah. Museum, so we all seen that wall. Yeah. Mob Museum crew! Ooh, ooh. <laughs> we should That's go sweet. together. Let's go. I'm going in <laughs> September. Do you have pictures of it? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. So. I do. I too. have a couple. I took pictures just about everything there. <laughs> Me too. Wait, did you sit in the electric chair? Uh, Kelly did. <laughs> <laughs> did you do the thing where you get made? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys are made men? Yep. What about Me you, Duke? No, I didn't do any mob okay. larping. <laughs> so I, I did the thing where you get made. And the whole time I was like, yeah, this is kind of lame. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm doing something. I'm busy. I'm trying to get paid. Get off me. <laughs> like, yeah, this is so lame. This is weird. Respect the moment. <laughs> no, I, I admit, I'm, I was even lamer because I wanted to, but I was like, no, we're just going to check this shit out and leave because it was at, like the last thing we we're doing before we headed out of Vegas. And I, I gotcha. think... Actually, I think those things were shut down because they have a few. They also had a forensic lab. Like, there's a couple different shits you can do. Yeah, well, so this would be the second episode that the Mob Museum came up. And I would say 100%, man. People should go check it out because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, cool shit. I was expecting to be underwhelmed. I thought it would be kind of lame or something. But it's a... There's a lot there. There's a lot of history. You get to watch that uh, film in the actual courthouse that the Kafafer hearings were in you go see yeah, the actual that actual St. Valentine's Day massacre so it, it was it was dope I dug it man I so, they got little things with headphones where you can like listen to recordings with I was just shit. saying that oh my bad say it now I <laughs> listened to all the wiretap audio and it was mm. pretty freaking cool yeah word and I say for most people Look, if you go to Vegas and you're on the strip, you probably turned this podcast off a long time ago, so you're not even hearing this. Like, if you're still listening, you're definitely on Fremont. Yeah. So Where my Fremont people at? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying you never go down to the strip, but I'm just saying uh, down in Fremont's where the the Down River Party is. The craziness. Yeah. So the bumps with one arm. What's up? <laughs> Yeah, there was definitely titties all over the place. <laughs> hey, like I said, that place is just one big block party. You just walk up and down with beers and now weed's legal. Like, it's just a giant yeah. block party. It's sweet. 
I fucking love Fremont Street. I like Binion's. And I like Teddy's. We uh we're big in Michigan. We got a big listening base in Michigan. So if you're there, the the D Casino is uh downtown Vegas. You get conies and shit like that. Uh, they got on, they got Andiamos. Yeah, and it's just like a being in Down River because after like midnight, the casino restaurants are shut down, and the only thing you can eat is the Coney Island. Right. Oh. <laughs> Coney Island, and White Castle. <laughs> yeah. See, but people in New York think Coney Island something totally different. Here, it's a shitty restaurant. It's a diner. It's del- delicious. It's a great diner. But yeah, so the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, it's really the event that turned the tides on Al Capone's career because at that point, you were already coming out of the Roaring Twenties, you know, when Prohibition was at its height and you're starting to tip towards the Depression. And once this happened, a lot of his shtick went from being the lovable outlaw Robin Hood character to people looked at it a lot darker. You know, once you gunned down seven people uh, in a spot like that, that was unheard of, and it was it was real shock. So all of a sudden, the law was coming at him harder. Like after that, the next couple of years, he spends in and out of jail, kind of bouncing around, hiding out from cases, hiding out down in Florida when he can. So this really marked the downfall of Jack McGurn also after the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Even though he got away with it, no one was ever charged. Everything took a hill, a turn for the worse after that. He got away with it forever? Yeah, nobody ever got charged with the the murders or anything. They found the guns in Michigan. Uh, oh, they're, they're in Michigan? A, yeah, Fred Killer Burke, when he got busted, he had a machine gun that was used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and that was used to shoot, uh, kill Frankie Yale. And now they're, it's out like north, northwest from here, but it's a police, uh, a state police station. They have them on display. So we're going to take a quick smoke break, refill our drinks, and we'll be back in a minute. Pull up, roll something if you choose to. Intermission time, business to tend to. We'll be back in a minute or two. Say hello to the bad guy coming back at you. Yeah. All right, we're back. So every time when we cover the history in a month, there's always a lot of birthdays, but there's always going to be a lot of deaths too. Well, obviously... The first deaths would be the seven people that got killed at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That makes sense. That's just Uh, one day. Yeah, so Hmm. just on the 14th, we got these seven. Uh, The the big two would be these first two. So this is Frank and Peter Gussenberg, who were two of the North Side's biggest (laughs) hitmen. Looks like Vince Vaughn. (laughs) Maybe the mom did their hair. Most of the other guys... One guy, James Clark, is was the second in command. Some of them were just kind of goons or gamblers that were just happened to be hanging around. Uh, this guy right here at the end is probably what got everybody killed is he kind of resembled Bugs Moran. So that's who they were trying to get. They seen that guy walking in and they're like, yeah, that looks like him. But yeah, Bugs Moran was running <laughs> late. So since he was running late, uh, by the time he pulled up, he seen like all the police there and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know what? Just keep rolling. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, like, well, it turns out there's a shooter here. I don't want to be around here. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. straight on that. That looks like we're exactly where I was going. I'll just call and see what happened. <laughs> oh, people that look like me are getting shot? Ah, let's go. <laughs> Wait, that second guy looks like Vince Vaughn. I can see that. Those two, the Gussenberg brothers, they were like Jack McGurn's fear of rivals. Some people say that that was more what he was concerned about that ultimately he didn't really care because he didn't give a fuck about killing bugs moran he just hated the gustenberg brothers and wanted them Mm -hmm. too dead so jack mcgurn was kind of like whatever bro works for me some people say it's the same guy but he just sat across from a funhouse mirror (laughs) and looked like (laughs) all right whoa whoa so what's up with these chins This first guy at the end here, that's Vincent Mad Dog Cole. He died on February 8th, 1932. 
he was a legitimate lunatic. He's probably a future episode, someone that we'll cover eventually. Right here with the mean look, that's Frank Costello. We covered him. He was born last month. So he was born in January, died in February. But this is at the Kafafer hearings where he got pissed off and walked out because he was sick of their <laughs> bullshit. And then ended up doing 14 months in prison for that. Like, we've never been able to catch you on anything, but you just walked out of a Senate hearing, stupid. You're in trouble. Looks like he's on a Zoom call and his wife's flashing him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just what I look like when I have this. <laughs> this guy here, this fucking World War II bomber. <laughs> that's Bugs Moran, who even though he escaped the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, he died in... uh February 25th, 1957, like an old washed up kind of gangster. Like eventually after Prohibition ended and Northside Gang went away, he was just like a half-ass gangster and shit. A half-ass chin. Yeah, there's a lot of fucking, uh, what is that called? Butt chin. The butt chin. There's a real name for it, isn't there? I think butt chin. Oh, I'm, is sure, I'm sure butt chin is not the same. <laughs> oh, ain't it cleft chin? Yeah, cleft chin. That's what they call it? Yeah, that's it. And then uh, this is Vito Genovese. He looks very surprised to be getting a picture taken of him. <laughs> hey, what's that? Vito Genovese, <laughs> he died uh, February 14th, 1969. He was a legit scary dude. So the Genovese family is still one of the five families. It originally was the uh, Masseria family or the Morello family. It was the Luciano family. Now it's the Genovese family. But he's one of the all-time most feared mob bosses. So wait. He died on February 14th, but not in the massacre. Correct. What year is which? The massacre was in 1929. Vito Genovese died in 1969. Oh. 69, dude. (laughs) Okay, stop. (laughs) It's a fucking uh, Bill and Ted joke. Oh. Oh, I thought it was Billy Madison. (laughs) You thought it was who? Well, it's Billy Madison, too. Oh. Age um, difference. Right. <laughs> so, uh, the biggest death to happen in the month of February is Machine Gun Jack McGurn. Oh. So, a day after. Yeah. Well, technically, it was just late at night. So oh. early morning on St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So I remember that. People think it was probably retaliation for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre because it was, you know, seven years later. I don't remember it like I was there. I remember you guys did this episode. <laughs> you did it too. You were there. You remember. Was I there? February 15th, 1936. <laughs> Come on now. It was at night. Remember? Was I on the episode? You were on that episode. That's why I remember <laughs> that. I mean, yeah, I but- listened to them all, but... So you could go back and listen to the Jack McGurn episode. I was on it. It's a good one. I think it's one of our uh, one of our top episodes. I mean, look, he's one of those great characters. He had so many names that by the time people thought they had his real name, that was still like his second to real name. Like people be like, "No, I know it's Vincent Gerbardi." Like, no, that's actually not it either. <laughs> but yeah, he went from being one of Capone's top guys and one of the most feared guys in the Chicago outfit to getting shot in a bowling alley by his so-called friends it was by his so-called friends for sure and probably retaliation for the saint valentine's day massacre and he was being a general rabble rouser i mean his name is machine gun jack mcgurn you think he's just out out being a cool guy he's a little stinker he's (laughs) out there just getting into mischief not anymore so another thing in the january episode that We got a lot of feedback on that people dug were the two ridiculous pitchers. So we had the Giuseppe Greco pitcher and uh, Tony Giacalone. And uh, we got a bunch of traffic to the to the social media. People seem to dig it. So I figured we'll do the favorite pitcher of February mob history, which is Joseph (laughs) the Animal Barboza. That can't be real. That's, oh, that's Saturday Live. It was like Tony Clifton. It was like Tony Clifton and uh, Andrew Dice Clay got mixed. I think it's Chris Farley. Which would be one hell of a stand-up special, I'll tell you that much. 
So this is Joseph the Animal Barbosa who died February 11th, 1976. Um, he was a hitman turned snitch. He was one of the first people to ever go into witness protection. Really? It obviously didn't work because one day he was him. walking to his car and he got shot four times with a shotgun at close range. It's a fucking animal. <laughs> he sounds like this sort of guy like after every time he got shot, he said, oh, <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. This picture was taken when somebody said, Hey, if you're cool, raise your hand. Oh. But yeah, with the uh, Giuseppe Greco pictures and the, uh, the Tony Giacalone pictures, I thought, like, okay, that's going to be a one time. There's no way there's going to be a hilarious picture every month. But so far, I think so good. <laughs> I was able to fucking pull out this Thank beauty you. of a picture. <laughs> All right, so the last one we got to cover is uh, I'm going to do the month in mob history from a pop culture perspective. As we covered in January, January was Sopranos, and people do not like Dan's take on the final episode. I think Loser. I think I don't mind it. I just didn't say much or just edited out whatever I did say and uh, just let Dan catch all the flack. This month we got February 28th, 1997, where we got another classic mob gem. Oh, you didn't even let us guess? You were just showing us? My bad. I guess Donnie Brasco. (laughs) Donnie Brasco. Uh, Who are they supposed to be? Uh, so El Pacino is a guy that's uh, named Lefty Ruggiero, who's a real guy. He's also known as Lefty Two Guns. And then uh, Donnie Brasco was uh, Officer Joe Pistone, who went undercover. Oh, did we cover that guy? No. I want to know Two Guns. <laughs> um, He definitely is somebody we could cover. He seems like he was kind of a a, a bolt, like a a real dick of a mobster, like an old grumpy guy, like a real curmudgeon. Yeah, it wasn't real cool like the other guys. Right. <laughs> other like the... They were so laid back and go with the flow. This guy was real serious. <laughs> I wonder if he was good with financials. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got one more. It's It's another movie, and it came out with a release in February. I guess I'd give you a chance to guess. It's not a mob movie, but it's definitely bad guy related. It's what what a, year? Oh, uh, what year? That would help. Fuck, I gotta look. No, what February of any year. Just pick a oh. movie. Oh. <laughs> you know, you know. Pick a movie. movie. Oh, I got it right. Every Casablanca. My, my bad. I got it right here. Yeah, I did just pick any movie. <laughs> I know. So, uh. Everyone knows movies by the month they were released. Come on. <laughs> common knowledge. I'm getting high, man. What do you want to do? Sure. You know, if it's not the normal format, I really struggle with this. <laughs> so, February 5th, 1993. 93. You said it's not a mob movie, but it's what? It's uh, it's in the crime-sphere. It'd be like bad guy related. It's a gang movie. Crime-sphere. Oh, um, boys in the hood. <laughs> it's a solid guess. I'm not sure. Boys in the hoods. It's, it's probably 91. I would well, guess. 91. Yeah, it's right around there. But it is blood in, blood out. Oh. <laughs> no way. No. I don't know if I've ever seen that. What? I sound like yeah, DC. Is movie fucking like three and a half hours long. <laughs> It is about three and a half hours long. Yeah, that's fucking Dang. Nonsense. In 1993, that's the longest movie I ever heard of. It's about a white dude who's half Hispanic, so he tries to act Hispanic, while the Hispanics are like, hey, you're a white dude. It's pretty much yeah. the gist of that movie. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> and it's three yeah. and a half hours long of that. He says, the white guy going like, but I'm really what? Hispanic, Holmes! Like, don't talk uh-uh. to the boy. He's like, but I can't help it! No. <laughs> no, he talks like that the whole movie, and he has, like, blonde hair. Very upsetting. What? And I don't Wait. think the actor is really Hispanic at all. I think he's just a white dude. That's well, he's based on a character. More... Blood in, Blood Out and American Me are both basically based around a similar screenplay, which is 
the story of San Quentin gangs and the Mexican mafia or whatever, but the character is based on a real person, which was a white guy that like came up as a leader in the Mexican mafia. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, what was his name in American me? JD. Or I think I saw blood and blood out and American me like one time. And I barely remember. It was JD and American me and milkweed or Miki Lowe or whatever his name is. From blood and blood. Yeah. What? I thought I nailed it. All right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Say it again. Be cool. And then uh last pop culture thing I got is uh February ninth, nineteen forty three is uh Joe Pesci was born. Hey. So he's also a February birth also. That's worth a mention. Yeah, I figured I want to leave out Joe Pesci. I mean we're talking mob movies and whatnot. Or my cousin Vinny. Uh, you worked on the opposite side of the law on that one. I'm a I'm a big fan of my cousin Vinny. I think, it's I think like that's the movie that got everyone hooked on Marissa Tomei. Oh yeah, that's where I fell in love with her at. I can't speak for everybody, but I know <laughs> definitely worked for me. I still have to say that things are identical. <laughs> a lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about when I do. <laughs> My my favorite part of the movie is still uh, when he's giving his little pre lecture and he says it comes from England and all our little old ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it cuts to those fucking two black jurors just looking at him like, "What the fuck is he talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> no, my favorite one is like when he's trying to test the old lady's eyesight and he goes, "How many fingers am I holding up?" And the judge goes, "Let the court." Show, yeah. He is holding up two fingers. It's like, <laughs> Judge! <laughs> so say good night to the bad guy. Go on. The last time you're going to see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. All right. So, yeah, before we wrap it up, I want to uh, give shouts. Everybody hit us up in the last episode. So, uh, Paul, Renee Jr., Eli. We appreciate you. And then the OG listeners too, like Sean and Frank and uh, Derek in Canada. So <clears throat> it's really cool to like go a while without putting out episodes. And then you put everything out. As soon as you start putting them out, everybody's right back there. Like, what up? Who's waiting for you to put out episodes and shit? You love oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> you really love me. So thank you. And now... Yeah, a lot of questions about the song. It's a new song we had had made for the show. The Suedo song was awesome, but for purposes on YouTube, it's just easier for us to have our own song. So we had the new song done, and I don't know. I think it's dope. I think we have good feedback on it, but yeah, that's the reason that we went with with the new song. But so now we're trying to grow the YouTube. So say so go to the YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel and watch one of the episodes on there. I did. Me too. I did twice. Oh shit! <laughs> now we're up to two views. Well, so that's gonna be. I don't know if we're gonna do a march. What? So, well, I, I, who knows? What if we, this one goes out? And people are like, it was a one-hit wonder. The first time was dope. The second one, boo! This is. It had a whole massacre in it. I know you fucking lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this is Say Hello to the Bad Guy. Thanks for coming, and thanks for listening. Man, it feels good to be a bad guy. Telling stories that bring the underworld to life. Gangsters, mobsters, hustlers, monsters. Stars of the conversation as we sip on our libations. So come and share some laughs. It's true crime with a twist. Every episode's a banger you don't want to miss. Infamous criminal masterminds with fascinating lies. Blurring lies between truth and lies. We talk about killers with mob ties. Extortionists, wise guys, crack jokes, have a few drinks. It's a good time. Made men who made men tremble for a living. May have ended up in prison, but they still made a killing. Yeah, we keep it real gangster up on this side. Some good fellas, but no more Mr. Nice Guy. Chronicling criminal minds, we are street certified. Say hello to the bad guy. Say hello to the bad guy. Bad guy. 
Say hello to the bad guy, bad guy. Say hello to the bad guy who's street certified. Say hello to the bad guy.